Our story this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 4, and it is a stark and tragic story. Look with me in your imagination, but you don't have to imagine very much because the story is told in great detail in 1 Samuel 4. The first thing you notice is an old, fat man sitting by himself on a bench by a busy pathway. The Bible says he's 98 years old. He's very heavy. And he's blind. From a distance, it's a sad sight. But we move a little closer. And it's amazing because it looks like he must have been a very important man. He's wearing a very special garment, something in the back of our mind says this is a special garment. It looks very expensive. It looks almost regal. We get a little closer and we notice that this garment that looks very expensive and regal, almost royal, is a little dirty. Well, it's a little dirty because he still likes to eat too much and he misses his mouth. He's blind and this expensive garment is soiled. We look a little closer and say, Oh, this is not just a special garment. This, oh, this is a consecrated robe. This is a holy garment. This, oh my, this, I know what it is now. This is the robe of the high priest of the Most High God. This has to be Eli, the high priest himself. Now it's very interesting. We move a little closer, and we see that this old, fat, blind man is shaking He's trembling. He's afraid. He's nervous. His heart is beating. Something's agitating him. We get a little closer, and we find out what is agitating him because he has a question. He's blind. He can't see, but he can hear footsteps off in the distance. He can tell when people are close by, and this old, fat, scared, frightened man has one question. What has happened? Tell me. Does anybody have news? Can you share with me, please, somebody? Stop telling me what has happened to the ark of God. What has happened to the presence of God? 1 Samuel 4 tells us that as this man is sitting there alone on the bench, leaning forward to hear of any news, the Bible says his heart trembled for the ark of God. Think of it. His heart trembled for the ark of God. His heart trembled for the presence of God. And his one concern, his one question, his one fear, what has happened to the presence of God? Let me ask you this morning, does your heart ever tremble for the ark of God? Does your heart ever tremble for the presence of God? Do you ever wonder, where is the presence of God in my life? What has brought us to this tragic moment? Forty years of disobedience and compromise has brought us to this point. The Bible says that for 40 years, prophets had come to Eli and warned him. Not two months, three months, five years, not 10 years. But the Bible says, you can read it, for 40 years, prophets had come and said, take care of the presence of God. Honor the ark of God. Remember, he was the high priest. This was his job. This was his responsibility. This was his duty. This is what he got paid to do. It was his occupation to take care of the ark of God, the high priest. And the Holy of Holies was responsible for all of the worship, all of the adoration, all of the music, all of the ceremony, all of the the attendance and all of the worship of God was the high priest's responsibility. You know what happened to Eli? He got used to it. 
he began to take the presence of God for granted. The presence of God in Israel at that time was typified by the Ark of the Covenant. You know that Ark laden with gold? In it was the tablets of the law, some showbread, some manna that God had rained down from heaven, the cherubim, the seraphim. On top of it, it was a holy place to meet with the holy God. And God had decided to manifest his presence around that ark. Follow the ark to the promised land. Stay close to the ark. Stay close to the presence of God. Forward a few hundred years and find that Jesus Christ died on a cross between heaven and earth. And when he did, the veil was rent from top to bottom. And from then till now, the ark's been missing. Why? Because God wants you to know that the ark has moved inside of you and inside of me. We are now the carriers of the anointing and the presence of God. You, me, these vessels of clay, we are responsible to be the high priest of the Most High God in our own lives. But Eli had taken the presence for granted. And he loved people more than the presence of God. This tragic day had started out in great dismay because the Philistines were attacking Israel and Israel said, God's on our side. We're on God's side. Let's go out and whoop these boys. And they went out and fought the Philistines and guess what happened? 3,000 Israelites died. God, where are you? We thought we were yours. We thought you were ours. We thought we could depend upon you, God. There are times God is silent. And this day, God was silent. Israel was about to hear and to find out that God's patience had run out. And God's mercy has reached its limit. They scratched their head. They said, we were beaten by these Philistines. We who beat the army of Egypt, we who we have took Jericho, we, 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 we would get God. And what has happened? Somebody at the bride of you know what we got to do? <laughs> we got to get the ark of God. We got to have the presence of God go before us. They said, oh, my goodness, that's what we missed. That's exactly right. Go back to Shiloh. That's where Eli was with the, temp with, with the ark. That's where his sons, Phineas and Hophni, were over the temple worship. They said, go back to Shiloh, bring the box, and we'll be okay. That's exactly what they said. Bring that, bring that talisman, bring that charm, bring that good luck thing, bring that object that we all were excited about for so many years, bring the box back, and we'll be fine. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 4 that they got word back to Shiloh. Everybody said, that's a great idea. And Phineas and Hophni led the march. And the Bible declares there was so much joy in the camp. Oh, we got the ark. We got the box. We're going to win now. Nobody can beat us now. You killed 4,000 this morning. We're coming back with the box. And the Bible says there was so much shouting, so much joy, so much rejoicing that the earth shook with the noise of the shout of the people of Israel. So excited. The box is coming with us this time. But do you know you can make a lot of noise and be so far from God's presence? You know you can sing all the right songs and God not show up? You know you can memorize the way to act and you can show up to church and do the thing and God be a million miles away. And that's what they found out. See, the Philistines camped just over the hill. They heard the shout. They, they heard the ground quake. What, what's going on? And somebody said, oh, the ark of God is with them now. They, they brought the presence of God with them now. And, and we're in trouble. So the Philistines said, 
Oh, we're going to have to fight like we've never fought before. They got their God on their side now. We got to fight harder than we've ever fought before. They went into battle. The Israelites, we got the box. We got the ark. We got the ark. We got the box. You're going to go down. We got the box. And 30,000 Israelites were killed by the Philistines that day. 30,000. Now, Eli hasn't heard this yet. He's outside of Shiloh. He knows the ark went to battle, but he doesn't know what's happened. So everybody who's coming by, what's happened? Is there any news? Somebody tell me. I can't see somebody. Anybody get news? My heart is trembling for the ark of God. My heart is aching for the presence of God. And we say, Eli, you're about 40 years too late. Long time before now, you should have worried about the presence of God. But he loved stuff. And he loved his sons more than he loved God's holy presence. Because those two boys who were leading the party that day, the Bible tells us that they were evil men. Eli knew this. His sons, Hophni and Phinehas, stole from the offerings that were brought to God. They took the best of the offerings. They snuck into the treasurer's office and said, we'll take this off the top. And if that wasn't bad enough, that they were stealing from objects of God's worship, they were thieves. They were also stealing the innocence of the young women of Israel because when young, attractive women came to worship God, they seduced them and said, hey, on your way to worship, come in here in our back tent and let's get it on. And they've been doing that for years. The Bible says that Eli talked to them, said, oh, come on, boys. Cut this out. Yeah, it's a smart nap. And they said, Dad, shut up. And he said, okay. And he allowed his boys to desecrate God's presence and to use God's people for their own sexual and financial gain. And God said, this day, your soul is going to be required because you so abused my presence. Eli, the blind, 98-year-old, fat man, crying, where is the presence? My heart is trembling. Where is the ark? It's too late, Eli. The man from Benjamin came running by. He heard him. Hey, 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 do any news? The man stopped and said, yes. Yes, there's news. 30,000 of our soldiers have died, Eli. His heart and your sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they died his heart. Then the man from Benjamin said, the ark of God has been taken. The Bible says, when Eli, that unfaithful, compromising, weak high priest, heard what had happened to the ark, he fell over hit his head, and died. And that is the tragic end of Eli and Phinehas and Hophni, who abused the presence of God, who mocked God's truth, who knew the songs to sing. Think of it. They knew how to whip up a crowd so much that the earth would shake but they had no relationship with the presence. So when they counted on the presence to protect them, they had no presence. They only had a pretense. What about my life today? Do I take the presence of God for granted? Do I pretend to know how to operate in the anointing? Or have I been with Jesus? Can I carry his presence? Do I compromise with what I read, what I watch, the movies I watch, the things I give my life to, 
my affections, my attentions, my adoration, my idols, my worship. I want so much else. And they're giving me a little presence on Sunday morning, God. I believe, church, we're coming to a day in America, in Canada, and around the world when God's patience is going to run out. And he's going to want to know, do you want me and nothing else? You may have heard the story of two young evangelists who started out in the 1950s. They were taking America by storm. Billy Graham and Chuck Templeton, powerful, powerful evangelists, filling stadiums and arenas everywhere across America. And everybody said, well, Billy's, Billy's okay, but, you know, he's a little bit of a country bumpkin, and he's got that southern drawl. He's probably not going to go very far, but Charles Templeton, he's Canadian. He's got that uh, smooth talk, and, and man, he is going to take the world for Christ. Chuck Templeton, watch where he goes. Well, Chuck Templeton made a decision. Billy Graham made a decision to question their faith. Billy Graham, in a dark night of the soul in Florida, took his Bible, went out on a stump, and said, God, right now I don't feel you. I don't even know if you're real. And I don't want to fake anything. I don't want to be a phony. I need to know now, God, is this real? Are you real? Is the Bible the truth? Is Jesus really alive? And he laid an open Bible on a stump. And he said, in a moment's time, it felt like heaven opened. God came down. Glory filled his soul. And he said, I knew from that moment to this moment, decades later, that every word of God is true. I went back to study, find out that the Bible was true. History does record that Jesus Christ lived, died, resurrected, rose to heaven, and is coming back to get, again, and he'll save anybody who wants to believe in him. And Billy Graham is still in a wheelchair in North Carolina preaching the gospel. But his friend... Charles Templeton had the same kind of crisis of faith. And he picked up a Time magazine one morning. And he looked at the picture of an African woman holding her dead baby in her hands, crying. And Satan entered his mind. And Satan asked him this question, how can there be a God of love and power when there's so much suffering in the world? And he turned his back on God. Instead of becoming a preacher of righteousness, that Canadian atheist wrote many books, one of them called Farewell to God, doing his best to discourage anybody from believing in a personal God. He lost the presence. In the year 2000, Lee Strobel was writing some books, wonderful man of God who was doing his best to show the historicity, the veracity, the believability, the credibility of the gospel witnesses. So he's fascinated by Chuck Templeton's life story. He wrote him a letter and said, could I come interview you? And Chuck, older now, nobody knew it then, but he would die a year later. Lee Strobel got in a plane, flew to Toronto, Canada, got in a high-rise apartment building, went up and had two hours with Chuck Templeton. He said, I just decided to ask him about his life. And towards the end, he said, I, I started to ask him about why he can't believe in God. And he said, well, I've got so many reasons. I've written books about it. Lee Strobel said, but you do believe that there was a historical person named Jesus Christ? He said, well, of course, anybody knows that. Lee said, well, tell me what you know about Jesus. For the next 10 minutes, Chuck Templeton gave the most accurate, vivid, biblical description of a man unlike any other man who ever lived. His teachings, his ethics, his beauty, his love, his forgiveness, his grace. 
And his voice settled down from the harshness that he'd been talking. He said, there was never a man like the man Jesus. He strobel realized that God was speaking. He did, hardly wanted to interrupt. He said, what do you mean? And Chuck Templeton, gray-haired old man, now says, I am telling you, there never was a man like Jesus. There never was a man like him. And then he said these amazing words. Haltingly, slowly, he said, and with a trembling voice, he says, and I miss him. I miss him. Lee Strobel let that sink in for a moment. And he said, Chuck, what do you mean? Chuck didn't say a word. He sat there weeping, his shoulders heaving, crying. And then with a trembling hand, he reached over, picked up a cup of coffee, brought it to his trembling lips, took a sip, laid it down, and said, mm, after clearing his throat, enough of that, enough of that, and would not speak any more about Jesus. Now, was Charles Templeton having an emotional breakdown? No. That was one more chance that God gave a man who more, than, more years than Eli, more than 40 years, Chuck had mocked God, mocked the Bible, mocked Christians. And here comes Jesus one more time, knocking on his heart's door. So I ask you, is Jesus knocking on your heart's door one more time? Is that blessed man from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the pages of Holy Scripture, walking out of history and touching your heart today? Eli had 40 years to repent. You see, I, I can't promise you that you'll have 40 years. I don't know. I've known people that it seems like they, they had a very short time and said no. I can't promise you 40 years. So if you've been running for 20 and say, I got another 40, oh, you're playing with God. You're playing with fire. All I know is this. You can get back to his presence. You don't have to keep on missing him. There's just a few simple avenues. One is prayer and the word. Getting alone with God, like Billy Graham said, like Billy Graham did and said, God, speak to me. God, show me your power. It might be at an altar, at a church. It might be at a stump in the woods. It could be in your car, at your bedside. But getting somewhere alone with God and saying, God, I want to know you. I want to feel you. I want to taste and see that the Lord is good. I need an experience with God. You will find it when you get alone with him in prayer and in the word. You'll find it as you will worship him. You know, some of the greatest times of worship you'll ever have is when you choose to worship God in spite of your circumstances, in spite of the mountain, in spite of the desert. You'll lift your hands and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him like Job. You'll lift your hands and say, I will worship God when I don't understand him. I will shout even when I don't feel like the ark is right beside me. I will declare that Christ is in me, the hope of glory, and greater is he that is in me than he that is within the wor world. And when I worship God, his presence will manifest. And you will see him. Oh, maybe not with an eye, but you will see him. You won't have to be blind like Eli, like Eli and, <coughs> and not aware of his presence. You can know him. One day you'll look upon him face to face. 
One day your worship will turn into wonder. One day your worship will turn into wow. One day your worship will turn into what on earth did I ever worry about? Because you'll see him face to face and you'll be like him for you will see him as he is. So the application for my life and yours today is this. I will determine to never take the presence of God for granted. I will determine not to grieve the Holy Spirit, not to quench the Holy Spirit, not to put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that this weekend, this Sunday, today, is 110-year anniversary of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Azusa Street? When God said, there's some hungry people, and they don't care if you're rich or poor, red or yellow, black or white. They don't care what side of the tracks you're on. They just know they want more of Jesus. And God showed up. Do you know that he's still looking for that kind of people today? You know it's okay to say, that's me, God. I want your presence. I don't want to ever be like one who says, I miss him. And if you're here this morning or watching me on video and you say, like Chuck Templeton, I miss him and I don't know how to get back, bow your head right now. Pray with me right now these words. Everybody in this place, stand to your feet as I bow to my knee. And everybody pray, oh, God. Everybody pray, oh, God. I need you. I don't ever, ever, ever want to be outside of your presence. I don't want to miss your anointing. I don't want to miss what you have for me.